Hello everyone, welcome to Directions Live Online. My name is Laura Berman and I am the host for today's webinar. As always, before we get started, a reminder that we are recording today's session and we will make uh, the recording available um, shortly um, after we wrap up today. Also, we have dedicated time at the end of the presentation for any questions that you might have. So please submit your question by typing them in the questions panel that you'll see in the GoToWebinar pane. So over the past few weeks, we've been showcasing emerging data sources from the Early Warning Network and their Early Warning Service for Severe Weather and Geospatial Hazards. And of course, last week, MAP Data Services showcased their many data offerings, including Geoscape and human movement data. So with an increasing amount of data feeds and the plethora of tools for analysing our data in ArcGIS, what is the best approach to analysing our data? So in our webinar today, we wanted to take a step back and consider a best practice approach to analytic workflows. And joining me today to present our session is Angus Hooper. Angus is based out of our Canberra office within the Federal Government Professional Services team. Angus works um, to implement spatial technology across industries including national security and environmental science. Angus also has a focus on scaling out GIS workflows and concepts to handle the challenges of big data and large scale imagery analytics. So certainly the best person to have us here today to talk about analytic workflows. And with that, I will hand over to you, Angus. Okay, thank you very much. All right, fantastic guys. Uh, thank you very much for attending everyone. So we'll just delve straight into it. So the agenda for the talk today is uh, what is spatial statistics? So we're gonna be talking about how does that differ from normal statistics? We'll talk about how we should apply spatial statistics to our business and our workflows. We're gonna talk about what tools are available and what we need to consider for data management overall. So how are spatial statistics used? Uh, I've got there on the right hand side, a real classic example. Uh, some would argue the beginning of it all, which is the 1845 Broad Street cholera outbreak map and just displays, you know, incidents of cholera clustering around a central location. And, you know, lo and behold, there was a particular well that was, you know, giving bad water and so on and so forth. And this is really, described in a lot of geography textbooks and, and stats textbooks about, you know, the first beginnings of health and analysis and spatial stats and all that fun stuff. So to extend that forward into the world of today, a local example of that would be the health and demographic analysis that the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare uh, produces. So they have to produce a bunch of statistical reports. And I'd really recommend that people have a, a look at some of the reports they, they create uh, to get an understanding of how some of these statistics are used in the real world. Uh, we've also got clients in the risk management uh, insurance and banking space. So we've done some work with them in regards to, you know, finding out data sets and, you know, knowing the unknown portions of, of their uh, risk data. Uh, you've got some classic examples of site selections. So food deserts and where we should put supermarkets or customer analysis, you know, distance drop off uh, spatial analysis for commuting, you know, how far are people willing to travel to access a service. Uh, and then we've got you know, classic case studies of national security. So a recent example would be population movements for a grand final and how should we plan that and you know, incorporate that into our, our business workflows. So spatial statistics versus normal statistics. You know, what makes statistics spatial? Uh, does location impact your data? Those fundamental questions. Now, how it tends to start is, you know, we all have a hunch about our data and whether it's influenced by location. And hunches are okay, uh, it's a great way to start, but it's better to use an actual tool that provides quantifiable validity that your data is spatial. An example of a, a tool that I'm gonna show later on is a spatial autocorrelation. And this can really be used as your primary diagnostic statistical tool to ascertain whether location influences your data. Now, we need to keep in mind here that uh, the normal statistical processes Totally valid, 100% fantastic. But if you're using statistics without spatially handling anything, and you're using it on spatial data, you're going to have a biased or flawed result because there's an inherent property of your data that isn't being reflected in your tools. And that's why spatial statistics is really its own thing. And it really helps us understand, you know, what are the chances that this event or this behavior uh, happened randomly? 
So applying spatial statistics. So the first way uh, I, I tend to go about it with clients is I really like to think of it from that, that scientific method and, and statistical methodology. So the first you know, port of call is what's the problem in our question, you know, our hypothesis. Now in an ideal world, you would already be using statistical analysis in an exploratory environment within your business to try and reveal potential areas of improvement within your business or ways to leverage your data that you hadn't considered before and finding those hot spots and cold spots and so on. Now, realistically, this might be a you know, new beginnings for you. So you need to make sure that you spend your time in this initial stage to create a firm base from which you can run your tests and, and really flesh out that foundation of what are we actually trying to answer here. So once we've defined that question, we really need to understand, is there a consensus already on this space? And, and do we have an idea of how we can answer this? And you know, the, the key um, a recommendation I tend to give is don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, read the literature, see if this has already been answered, consult your community. Uh, don't, don't try and um, burn a whole lot of time that doesn't need to be. So once we've got a good idea of you know, how we need to go about it or done our research, we can start to look at what statistical tools we can use. Uh, some of the ones that are, I'm sort of going to talk about and demonstrate are you know, ArcGIS Pro, uh, you've got R, you've got the various sort of Python toolkits, you've got Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Lab, you've got some uh, machine learning libraries as well that you can plug in and extend from those various components. So the fourth point here, do we have the data? Really critical. Uh, you need to make sure that your business understands and appreciates the value of good quantitative data and understand the inherent bias and flaws within your data collection process. Because there's a whole other arm of statistics purely around data collection and data management. It's really, really important that you, you value that and appreciate it. Then we can finally get into the actual bit we've been looking forward to, which is the analysis. Now, as the case with all of this, you really want to take some small steps first, understand what you need to answer, what the literature recommends, you know, little baby steps, and get a good idea before you start really diving in and, and using the big tools and, and the big workflows. Now, an important thing to appreciate right from the start is to have a plan in place for acceptance criteria through the various statistical methodologies you're gonna be using and define key achievable results, which can prompt an iteration of your analytic workflows to change the hypothesis, find new data, try a different tool, et cetera. And you really wanna make sure that in this project or, or workflow or what, however it is presented in your organization, that all people are involved in that analysis and they have a voice as to what should trigger an iteration and, and readdressing the question or the data and so on. And then the last bit is actually very important as well, which is how am I going to present what could be quite complex spatial information and statistical uh, problems to potentially a non-technical audience. And you really need to get across that, you know, what are the core concepts I have to present and how can I simplify and boil this down from a complex statistical process to potentially, you know, a printed PDF map to a non-technical audience. So applying spatial statistics and, you know, that, that, that's the sort of methodology that I, I tend to go through with uh, my organizations that I work with. And some of the key words that you want to be thinking here are descriptive statistics, inferential statistics, uh, some surface analysis and, and cartography of how we can present that. So I'm going to move into a demo here and to set the scene for this demo, I was looking more at sort of like a health basis. So um, what we've got here is trying to find out areas of vaccination rates that are high or low. Is there some patterns in vaccination rates across Australia in our SA3 boundaries? And, and what can we find out more about how vaccination rates are impacted across Australia? So the first thing that I did is I sort of, you know, managed all my data, got it all together, brought it in. And then, as I said before, I ran, I'm running this tool called spatial autocorrelation. And this gives me some p-values and some z-scores and, and also generates a report which lets me know whether or not my data is influenced by its location. And as we can see there, I had a, a really good z-score and uh, p-value which had statistical significance for clustering. So then we might move on to just some really quick initial tests of something like IDW, which is an interpolation technique, to try and see if we can predict data values in areas where we do not have data. So what I'm running here is the IDW tool, goes and runs, and it creates this thing called a geostatistical layer. Now, 
number one, we can see a problem there. It goes beyond the boundaries of Australia. So there are limitations to all of this that you need to understand. And there's an example of an SA3, which we do not have the data for. And that geostatistical layer in the background can give us an idea of what the data values are there. So we can interrogate that information and, and find out, you know, in this area, we might expect, you know, 93.4% and so on. But before we really want to start looking at, you know, our results and making a decision from it, we need to have an understanding of what the error margins are within our statistical processes. So we might want to see, you know, if spatial, if uh, the spatial implication of our data is quite large, there might be a lot of outliers and there might be a lot of errors. And so what we saw is there's actually quite a lot of errors there and error margins with our predicted values as opposed to our measured um, values. So because I saw quite a spread there, I was a little bit concerned. So I went and looked at the data and I saw that something was out by 8.7%, which is really significant. And that was actually the Byron Bay region there. So the Byron Bay region, we just did not predict or handle well at all with our very, very simple IDW analysis. So I thought to myself, okay, well, there's spatial autocorrelation here and there's a lot of variance in my data and there's a lot of errors. So maybe interpolation isn't gonna be as easy as I first thought. So now let's look at it from an outlier point of view. What are some of the outliers that I've got going on in my data? So just some bulk standard optimized outlier analysis and I run that. And essentially what it's gonna do is it's gonna give me some clustering information. So high, 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 low, et cetera. And zooming out, you know, I don't get a great view because of course, Australia's a large country. So I go into Brisbane and we can see that there's some low, low clusters in the middle there with some high, low outliers around it. So there's some interesting behavior going on there. And what I thought was quite interesting was Melbourne was actually the reverse. So Melbourne had some high, high clusters and then some low, high outliers. And so with that sort of information, we can start to see, okay, well, we've got some areas which stand out. And how can we use that for other areas where we may want to improve vaccination rates, like for instance, in the region of Byron Bay we saw before. So really just some simple initial descriptive um, methodologies to just poke at our data and see what it's, what it's saying and how it's behaving. So then we can iterate back and go, okay, what do we know? So, you know, some of the things that we saw from that were, are vaccination rates in Australia influenced by location? Yes, we all probably thought that as well. That's a pretty simple and standard hunch. Uh, we ran some outlier analysis and the report generated 10 location outliers. So we had 10 locations that were actually quite out there that weren't considered. And then we had 91 significant outliers. So 91 SA3s were actually, had statistical significance in their outliers in relation to their data around locations, uh, which is quite interesting. So, you know, why would this be useful? How could we actually use that? Well, you know, we don't get a direct result from that analysis, but what it lets us know is that we need to investigate further because there are influencing factors for vaccination rates in high outlier areas and low outlier areas and we might be able to use that information and diagnostics and, and delve in deeper with more granular data to help us maybe, you know, find some exploratory variables and explanatory variables and, and construct policy and so on around that. So just some really simple uh, steps there right out of the gate. So I just br I breezed through a bunch of statistical tools there. So to go at it from a high level point of view, you know, these are some of the, the key dot points that you're probably going to see when you're talking about spatial statistics. So the spatial statistics toolbox is used for analyzing patterns, clustering, distribution and regression analysis. And for the average user, the spatial statistics toolbox is more than sufficient and really describes your data quite well and tends to be user friendly with some assumed knowledge of, of maths and, and stats, you know, uh, that, that sort of high school level. Um, when you delve into the geostatistical analysis toolbox, uh, that's really when you're starting to get into inferential statistics, so generating continuous surfaces that can help you interpolate values and, and know those unknown portions of your data sets. And really, with, you know, there's a whole webinar in and of itself on that topic. And, and without going into too much detail, it's really important that before you start running these tools, you need to have a core understanding of a couple um, key concepts. So I would say that's Krieging, uh, Bayesian and empirical Bayesian statistics. Uh, you've got your semivariograms and your covariance, and also your interpolation theory. So you want to have a core understanding of that before you delve into the, the tools. And I'll explain why in a second. So then we've got uh, machine learning. So ArcGIS Pro has machine learning out of the box. And my favorite tool at the moment is the new forest-based classification tool, which uses um, decision tree frameworks to help you, you know, provide machine learning on your, on your data. And what you can do is you can use some of these tools out of the box. But if you want to extend the ArcGIS platform even further, you can leverage some of the machine learning methods in, for example, Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook, 
by using things like TensorFlow, NumPy, the SciPy kits, Keras, and so on. And there's some fantastic communities behind that that can really help you learn and get up to speed and ramp on that. And so when you use some of those frameworks, you can procedurally walk through your analysis within Jupyter, get that little kernel of truth or that little you know, interesting fact about your spatial data, uh, connect to ArcGIS Enterprise via the Python API, and then push that data up to your WebGIS and start to use some of that smart mapping technology and, and start to consider how can I present some of this information to my audience. And the last one there, um, I've got the R language. So R has been brought into the ArcGIS platform through this R bridge tool, which is a great way to leverage your business's existing R knowledge and incorporate that into your workflows uh, via geoprocessing tools. So as I said before, an example of, you know, making sure you know what you're doing before you get started. Um, this was a really great point that uh, I found when I was doing some statistical work with an uh, insurance company. And essentially what we were doing is we were using a tool called empirical Bayesian Krieging regression analysis. And, you know, long story short, what that does is interpolate values and try to give us data approximations and, and risk management approximations of areas we don't have data. And what we noticed is that there's a you know, very unique um, property of uh, the Australian uh, household environment, which is that we have quite a stark rural urban fringe, which means that between rural areas and urban areas, we get a you know, large spread of data. And uh, what was happening is one of the parameters there was uh, how many points, what's the maximum number of points per subset? And the default value is 100, and we just sort of accepted default values and clicked run, and we got this result. And I sort of thought to myself, well, that looks a little bit weird, let's have a play around with that. And so I reduced it down to something that makes more sense for the rural areas of, of how much um, households were in the local area. And we reduced that down to 50 points and we got a completely different result. And so I really want to highlight this as a cautionary tale of accepting your results at face value and not fully appreciating how the various parameters of the geostatistical tools impact your final result. So that's really when you need to go back to the literature, consult, understand and appreciate what the parameters are going to do and how they're going to impact your tools. So as I said right at the start, data management is one of the key areas that I wanted to highlight uh, today. Unfortunately, it's something that has a lot of impact on your spatial analysis and it's also quite a dry subject as well. So I'm not going to delve into it too much, but I want to highlight a couple key points. So data format. Uh, more often than not, data format is a constraint and you're constrained by what types of data and, and how it comes into your business. I would recommend that you try not to change your source and you try not to duplicate your data and work with what you've got. Uh, if you go down that road, you can burn and spend a lot of time in it. Uh, then you've also got this interesting issue of vector data versus raster data. And I've just got an example of a little hex bin uh, graphic there. So vector obviously being discrete and raster being continuous. Uh, we tend to uh, prefer vector data in uh, spatial analysis because it has a lot of granularity as to the actual specific location of our data value. But we might need to present vector data in a raster format for you know, various reasons. And I would recommend that you look at uh, hex binning as it's more preferable to raster because it doesn't have this cell issue of averaging data to an awkward shape, which is the square and actually has an appropriate resolution, um, trying to increase that, you know, handle that surface area to volume ratio. So with our storage constraints, in terms of the actual physically storing all this data, with some of the clients that I've worked with, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of terabytes, if not petabytes of raster information and analytics that they wanted to use. And that can be really difficult to handle. Uh, what I would recommend is, you know, keep it simple. So keep the data in its raw format as close as possible to the server that you're using to feed out those geoprocessing services or image services and so on uh, that get uh, consumed into your analytic workflows. Uh, for your vector data, you can use ArcGIS Data Store, which is a Postgres backend, and that should really be considered as your first choice for vector data due to the light nature of its storage. And there's a good Esri white paper that I'm going to reference at the end, um, which can help you sort of explain this space and, and research into it further. And then lastly, we've got this concept of, of big data. And in practice, when I've worked with clients, big data tends to actually just be lots of small, messy data sets that have been merged together. And more often than not, the schemas don't really align and there's lots of null values and so on and so forth. And if, you, you know, if your data is in arrays of arrays of arrays, which you know, always seems to be the case, then I would tend to recommend that your best bet is to delve into it with Python and R to really untangle it and using things like Jupyter Notebook 
um, to sort of spatially represent your data as you're trying to untangle it and get an understanding of what's going on. Uh, if those frameworks are a little bit confusing or a little bit too technical for you, uh, you can always rely on, on standard tools like ArcGIS Pro and FME, which have those nice, uh, uh, easy to understand GUIs. But yeah, key point there is, is just trying not to replicate that big data um, because you know it's big by nature and you don't want to double your storage. So the second last point here is, is the analyze and iteration uh, aspect. And as I said, I mean, there's a webinar in and of itself here, you know, for each individual tool. Um, the, the key thing that we want to really appreciate is, is something that was drilled into me at university in my stats lectures, is that correlation does not imply causation and you have to evaluate that. Uh, so before creating your final product, you really need to know whether your geostatistical methods and your processes are accurate. Uh, how we can do that is, uh, is through some of those uh, tools that I just showed. So for predictive models, you can use cross-validation and validation as your diagnostic tools. So cross-validation checks all your data, which, uh, as you can probably appreciate, is quite an expensive operation and will provide a report on unusual patterns and trends within your data, which might suggest that your autocorrelation model, your analytical model needs to be altered. And then validation is similar, but it checks a subset of your data, so a test data set, against the rest of your data, so your training data. And this is useful when you need to check for a specific criteria or subset in, in your data set. So using some of these tools really helps you understand your results. So therefore, is the model we're using not that great? And we need to stop and we need to iterate and change it, do some more research, you know, pivot a little bit. Do we just need to tweak it a little bit, maybe change one or two parameters, like that subset example? Or is actually we've got a, we're, we're onto something here, and this is really useful, and we can we can push forward and uh, and start to think about how we're going to present this information back to our end users. So presenting spatial statistics, I mean, once again, another webinar in and of itself here. I'd strongly recommend the reference material of How to Lie with Maps by Marc Momonier, which is this screenshot that I've got here, which is a great example of the same data set, so crude birth rate in the United States in the year 2000, represented three different ways through symbology to give a completely different view to the end audience, the end user. So it's really important that you understand that your final product and the, the effort you put into your final product is just as important as the actual effort you put into the statistical process. Too often people can just get zoned in on, you know, the spatial statistics and not consider how they're going to present it. So you need to make sure the effort you put into iterating and testing your models is replicated in your cartographic processes. So for those of you who are already familiar with How to Lie with Maps by Marc Momonier, you might also be familiar with How to Lie with Statistics by Daryl Huff. So that's another classic example of just going through the, you know, basics of, of how you should need, need to handle statistics to present it to your audience. So some of the resources that I've, I've talked about, so How to Lie with Maps, How to Lie with Stats, uh, that Esri white paper on, on data in ArcGIS, user managed and ArcGIS managed, really useful source material on how we should, you should do data management. But the key thing here is, you know, when I was learning some of this stuff uh, uh, three, four years ago, uh, the Esri help pages are an absolute goldmine. Uh, there's a lot of great content in there. And an example would be one of the pages of, you know, how Krieging works. And, you know, there's a whole lot of information and diagrams and so on that you can go through. And then what is particularly important is at the end of all of those articles, there might be 10, 15 sources to academic literature and other content online that can help you learn more about it. So I think it's really important that you consult those documents and that literature before you start delving into this space of using the descriptive and inferential statistics tools in the spatial statistics toolbox and the geostatistical toolbox. So that's really what I wanted to talk to about today, quite a large scope end to end. But uh, now I believe uh, we're handing back to Laura for a bit of a Q&A on, on some of the things that I've just discussed. Thanks, Angus. Um, and um, links to all these resources, um, when we send out the recording next week um, in the email, I'll have also have links to these so you can, you can find them in there. They're very, very useful. Um, and obviously, Angus, I've got several other webinars that we need to to host on this session around data management, visualization, and a whole lot of other things. So it's a massive topic. So thank you for today. Um, but questions. So if anyone does have a question, there's still time. 
Uh, you just need to enter that into the questions pane. And um, we have had a couple that have come through already. Um, so we have one here from, from Ben and he says that, uh, so we have large data holdings. Um, yep. So how can I improve performance with my statistical tools? Yeah, so uh, with, with the insurance client that I was working with, this was particularly a key problem. So uh, what they wanted was live feeds of the data and then some analysis on that data and trying to get you know live results to the end user. And, and we were talking about hundreds of terabytes worth of data. Uh, there's no easy way to to handle it. Uh, the, I think the key thing is, is from an infrastructure point of view, you want to try and keep all the blocks and barriers to a minimum. You want to try and keep everything into a single source of truth location. And you want to try and make that as close as possible to your servers that are feeding out that information and, and try to make sure that, yeah, all, all those SQL queries or whatever you're using are, are tight as, as possible to really emphasize performance. Uh, it's, a, it's a tricky space and um, there's a lot of lessons online uh, with, with how to help in that area. Okay. Um, a question from Sam is asking, what about temporal data? Can it be used with these tools? Yep, so um, temporal data is an interesting one because some tools are specifically made to handle it and then others just won't handle it at all. So the key thing there is that um, when your data gets expressed through as a date, uh, it's not an integer value and a lot of these tools specifically are catering, are cater to handle integer values. So, um, you know, the, some example workarounds for that would be uh, if you have a date field, you might need to, let's say you've got data over a year, you might need to break that out into something that's quantifiable. So assign each month a number of, you know, one through to 12, and then, you know, chuck that in as an exploratory variable uh, and so on and, and um, treat that or split it out into individual months. I mean, then you start to inherit a sample bias because some months have more days than others and so on. So it's, it's really tricky. I think the key thing there is um, uh, trying to use the tools that can handle temporal. So there's the space time cube analysis and so on. Um, and that's probably what I'd be pointing people more towards it rather than changing their data set to suit the tool, which is the sort of the wrong way to go about it. Okay. So yeah, the space time uh, cube tool is really useful in that space. Excellent. And we do have from Osri last year, Flora Vale, when she visited, she spent a whole session um, sort of talking to that, which is all available online as well, which is good. Uh, Okay, um, one last one I've got here. Um, so this is from Paul and he's asking, so what training content is available on machine learning and ArcGIS? Yeah, um, good question. So uh, there's a lot of stuff out there because it is quite the buzzword and quite a hot topic at the moment. Um, what I would recommend is, so I think recently on learn.arcgis.com, they pushed out a, uh, um, a sort of online training course uh, uh, for free on how to use that ArcGIS Pro tool I referenced, so the um, decision tree framework and the forest-based classification. Uh, that's a great start to sort of get yourself, you know, comfortable in that space and understanding it. Uh, then there's just some fantastic resources out there um, for learning, uh, machine learning. I certainly know that uh, one blog that I found about a year ago that I found quite useful was um, what are the machine learning techniques used to create um, some of those uh, playlists that you see in various um, uh, uh, sort of music offerings where they say, oh, you might like this song. You know, what machine learning processes were in the back end to discover that? And uh, those are some interesting ways to kind of interrogate the theory of machine learning and understand a bit more. But yeah, learn.arcgis.com is a classic one. But if you just Google something like Keras and TensorFlow with um, spatial data, there's, you know, 101 different blogs and, you know, the community is really, really handy to uh, help people learn. Thanks, Angus, and I might get you to um, send me links to um, some of those uh, extra resources yeah, yeah, and we'll include them next week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I agree, Learn ArcGIS is excellent. Um, okay, well, thanks everybody for all your questions. So uh, what's coming up next? So we'll be back uh, in a couple of weeks and we'll be joined by our partner, Nearmap. Um, so Nearmap will be showcasing their high-res 3D texture mesh and DSM and showing it all in ArcGIS Pro, so it should be great. Uh, so something like these really comprehensive models that are being used across government agencies, construction and engineering firms, and also, of course, urban planners. Um, so I'm really looking forward to having them on board um, to go through that session. So make sure that um, you can register for that one. That's up online now. And 
just lastly, as always, um, just reminding everybody that we, um, we're mid-conference season. We had a great event last week in Singapore. Um, we'll be in Malaysia on the 25th of October uh, for the Esri Malaysia User Conference. And in November, we'll start our roadshow. Um, we'll be in Sydney on the 13th of November, Brisbane on the 16th, and Melbourne on the 21st. Um, so make sure you jump online um, and, and register for the event. It'll be great to see you. Uh, but for now, um, just want to thank you, Angus, again. It was a really big topic. Um, and I know you'll definitely be back to start to tackle some of those other elements as well, no doubt. Um, so Cheers. thanks again. Um, and thanks to everybody who joined us today. Um, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks.